Today, you'll find out why people used to sit inside dead whales, whether a mosquito can suck the blood out of your bruise, and how the most ordinary chicken was supposed to save medieval Europe from the plague. Let's go. Get ready to be shocked. At first, I couldn't believe that was possible, but then I started thinking. So, a mosquito sucked some of the blood out of my bruise. A mosquito bit me on the bruise and sucked the blood out of it. A mosquito sucked my blood through a bruise. There seems to be no credible scientific explanation to be found, or even evidence that this is actually true. The mosquitoes can actually make your bruises go away. We've searched all over the internet, but okay, okay, otherwise there wouldn't be a video, right? We did find something. Can a mosquito drink blood from a bruise on purpose? Maybe it tastes better or something? I admit it'd be really interesting if this were the case, but alas, most likely insects don't even notice where they bite because they're attracted not by the smell of blood but by our presence. As they get closer to us, they detect body heat and substances called volatile fatty acids released from our skin. All this, plus the carbon dioxide we exhale, signals to female mosquitoes there's an animal nearby with the blood they can suck in order to breed. It doesn't matter which spot they choose to suck blood from, but even if we assume that mosquitoes could indeed smell bruises, the blood from them would hardly be delicious. After all, it's already become stale. I think it's like putting the cake in the fridge and then taking it out and finding that it smells of other food. Of course, you can still eat it, but it won't be so tasty anymore. Wait, can a mosquito actually bite deep enough to reach a bruise? I mean, their proboscises are so tiny. To understand this, you must first understand how bruises appear. Most often, they occur due to damaged capillaries. A small amount of blood spills into the surrounding tissues, not too far away from the skin. That's why we see characteristic marks. The bruise remains visible until the blood is either reabsorbed by the tissues or cleared by the immune system. Most often, bruises lie at a depth of 0.04 to 0.08 inches below the surface of the skin. At the same time, the length of the proboscis of a mosquito varies from 0.06 to 0.08 inches. That is, the length of the proboscis is almost the same as the depth of the bruises. If for some reason a mosquito wants to drink stale blood, nothing will stop it. On average, mosquitoes drink blood for about four minutes. Perhaps if a group of mosquitoes team up and decide to make someone's bruise disappear, they'll actually succeed. I wonder how many mosquitoes it'd take. If you need several pounds of them, then it might not be worth it. But mosquitoes sucking bruises, an idea I just came up with, is definitely not the strangest medical practice involving animals. People actually tend to come up with different absurd ideas and then believe in them, like treating rheumatism with the help of a dead whale. No kidding. Back in the late 19th century, a doctor could actually prescribe a patient to sit inside a rotting whale carcass to get rid of joint pain. According to an 1896 story in the New York Times, whale cure became popular after a drunken gentleman spotted a whale carcass on the shore and decided to climb into it. The smell of decomposition was so strong that the gentleman's friends could not get him out of the animal's remains on their own, so they just had to wait until he got out. And he did. The rheumatism he was suffering from for years entirely disappeared. In fact, the idea of using a dead whale for medical purposes came from the practices of the indigenous people of Twofold Bay, that is, from Australia. The Yuan people often encountered beached whales, so they knew what to do with them. Their bones could be used to build shelters, meat was consumed as food, and oil for ritual purposes, and the rest of the whale would help treat rheumatism. However, an animal killed by whalers would work too. There's a whole procedure to be followed. I hope you're not eating right now. So, while the interior of the carcass still retains some warmth, a hole is made in one of the sides of the whale large enough to admit a person. His lower body, from his feet to his waist, should sink into the intestines of the whale. Sometimes the immersion is even deeper, but the head of the patient must remain outside, otherwise the patient will simply suffocate due to ammoniacal gases. As the whalers say, it's these unbearably atrocious gases that bring about the cure. Not everyone can withstand this kind of procedure. Sometimes patients had to be lifted out in a condition close to fainting. But if a person still managed to endure sitting in the whale for the required amount of time, the doctors promised him at least a year without pain in the joints. 
The heat and gases released by the decaying whale were believed to combine to create a sweat box environment, relieving the pain of rheumatic diseases. I mean, it's like a sauna, only inside a dead whale. And people thought this method really works. Reports of the cure first appeared in Australian newspapers in 1894 and then quickly spread throughout New Zealand, America, and Europe. Respected publications wrote serious articles about the treatment with the help of whales. So why did people stop sitting inside dead whales if this method worked so well? As the whaling industry declined, so did the practice of the whale cure. It ceased to be practiced around the time of the First World War. However, the lack of whales probably wasn't the only reason for that. There was another very solid and very smelly reason. For a week or so after the treatment, the patient gave off a foul odor, which disgusted not only people but also animals. Hi, I am very ugly, but you should enjoy the movie anyway. So let's be grateful that people found more reasonable and less smelly ways to deal with rheumatism. Compared to dead whales, using ants to stitch up wounds doesn't seem all that weird. I mean, the idea sounds pretty nasty, but wait, there are much nastier things to come. Apparently, the idea of using ants as sutures came to people in prehistoric times, although the first recorded use was mentioned much later, in the Artharva Veda around 1000 BC. Though back then, ants weren't used for skin wounds, but for suturing intestinal wounds after surgeries. But they couldn't just decide to put the ants in the intestines, so it all started with simpler stitches applied outside, much earlier than 1000 BC. There is loose evidence that ancient people in India and South Africa used ants for stitches. According to them, the heads of large, biting ants clamped wound edges together. Not every ant is good for surgery. Species with fairly large mandibles are needed, for example, bullet ants. Army ants of the Dorylus genus, called Siafu, are also considered suitable for suturing wounds, also because of their large mandibles. As soon as you get the right ant, hold it by the back of the body or the thorax, pinch the wound closed, and bring an ant to it. The insect will be annoyed enough by this time to bite you. After that, all you have to do is pinch off its body, leaving the head of the ant along with the mandibles to close the wound. A couple of ants and the stitch is ready. The practice of using ant sutures in surgery persisted until the early Renaissance. It was abandoned for a number of reasons. Some doctors claimed that the human body rejected insects. Others considered them an outdated method of treatment. In general, ants can be difficult to get in the cold season. That's not convenient. Of course, in some places, ant suturing is still practiced, like in small villages in the Congo. Band-aids are not always available there, and in emergencies, ants are the best option. But if for some reason you thought stitching wounds with ants was a great idea, then, well, it's not. There's nothing good about it at all. That is, of course, the mandibles of an ant pinch the skin and technically can help close the wound. However, from a medical perspective, this is not a proper treatment. And besides, ants aren't sterile, which means they can bring an infection into your body. <laughs> the maggot therapy is much more frightening. Yes, they're disgusting. Yes, putting maggots in a wound is the last thing you'd want to do. But these blowfly larvae actually have an unlikely ability to heal. Not on purpose, of course, but maggot secretions calm our immune response. They eat rotting flesh, leaving healthy tissue largely intact. It's a cheap and affordable way to clean wounds from pus. Some practicing doctors even say that maggots do it better than surgeons. In the past, larvae were used to treat soldiers during different wars. For example, physicians in Napoleon's army knew about maggot healing properties. During World War I, the American surgeon William Baer noticed that soldiers with maggot-infested gashes didn't have the expected infection or swelling seen in other patients. They even recovered faster than those who didn't receive this treatment. This is most likely due to several properties of the larva, such as increasing oxygen concentration in the wound and enhancing cell growth. Maggot therapy was popular in the 1930s until the rise of penicillin in the 1940s. But the most interesting thing is that the maggots made a comeback later. This happened in the 1990s, when antibiotic-resistant bacteria created a new demand for alternative treatments. Today, there are about 1,500 medical centers in the U.S. and Europe that treat people with maggots. During the session, maggots are placed on a wound or suppuration and left under medical gauze for a couple of days. 
This method is effective for removing dead skin, treating chronic ulcers, bed sores, wounds that wouldn't heal. In short, that's a surprisingly effective way. Though it's important to understand that today, only special sterile maggots are used, not just any you come across. Another example of unlikely treatment is nematodes, tiny parasitic worms that burrow into insect larvae in the soil or on plants. Once rooted in the larva, the nematodes vomit up bacteria that release chemicals that kill the host larva. What does that have to do with curing people, you might wonder? To understand this, let's go back to 1862, the time of the American Civil War. On the evening after the Battle of Shiloh, some soldiers noticed that their wounds were glowing a faint blue. And when all the wounded were taken to field hospitals, it was the soldiers with the glowing wounds that had the best chance of survival and a quick recovery. The strange glow was dubbed Angel's Glow, and only in 2001 it turned out that the glow was produced by bacteria, the ones that live in nematodes. When the tiny worms got into the wounds from the dirty soil, the bacteria acted as usual and destroyed other, more dangerous microorganisms at the same time. Accidentally, they saved the lives of the soldiers. And now, by the way, have you ever heard of a cat piano? It's a highly controversial musical instrument which featured a row of cats fixed in place with their tails outstretched underneath the keyboard in such a way that when the keys are pressed, the cats make a loud sound, each cat in its own tone of voice. The device was described by the German physician Johann Christian Riel for the purpose of treating patients who've lost the ability to focus their attention. Riel believed that if they listened to this cat instrument and looked at it, it'd inevitably capture their attention and they'd be cured. A fugue played on this instrument must bring even the most withdrawn person from their fixed state into conscious awareness, he wrote. What amazing logic. Indeed, ignoring screaming cats is quite difficult. There were other ideas, for example, to reduce melancholy with the help of a musical instrument. Most people today wouldn't find cats crying out in pain in the least bit funny, but the 17th century Europeans had a very different attitude towards these animals, so it was quite reasonable to assume that in theory, someone could find it funny and thus be cured of the melancholy. Steve and I personally condemn this, and so does the cat. Fortunately, this instrument only existed as a concept. People have been talking about the cat piano for over 400 years, but there's no evidence that it was actually made. According to the Museum of Imaginary Musical Instruments, yes, there's a museum like that, the first image of a cat piano could be seen in a book printed around 1600. There, some creepy guys were playing the cat piano during the ritual, and other animals stood around like singers, facing the music stands. In general, it's as unrealistic as it gets. Still, it was the cat piano that inspired this guy to create something similar, but without actual cats, of course. Instead, he presses on the toys, and this is actually funny. So whales can cure rheumatism, cats can reduce melancholy, and chickens can cure the plague? Yes, it sounds like a joke, but it was a real method that people often used. It's believed to have been invented by the English surgeon and anatomist Thomas Vickery, and I have no idea how he even came up with this idea. Just listen to this. First, the butt of a live chicken had to be shaved. Then they tied it to the swollen lymph nodes of a sick person, along with the rest of the chicken, of course. After the chicken also got sick, it had to be washed and applied to the person again and kept until only the chicken or the patient stayed healthy, whoever gets lucky. And this method was really very common. Many chickens got sick and spread their plague-infected parasites everywhere, so there were definitely no healthy people after such treatment. But apart from these controversial chicken procedures, Thomas Vickery was a fairly well-known and successful physician. The Royal College of Surgeons of England holds an annual lecture in his honor. Another medical procedure involved finding and killing the snake, cutting it into pieces, and rubbing this into various parts of the swollen lymph nodes. It was believed that the snake, as a symbol of Satan, draws the disease out of the body because evil is attracted to evil. Doves were used in the same way, although it's not clear why the doves were chosen and how they were related to the forces of evil. Though you could actually expect anything from doctors of the past. Take the ancient Egyptians, for example. They knew about the existence of a pulse, performed the first surgeries in history, made prosthesis, and at the same time, they prescribed a dead mouse paste to their patients. What? That had to work. The recipe's simple. All you have to do is mash up a dead mouse with some herbs and that's it. You have a great natural pain relieving agent. 
Today, we understand that putting a dead mouse into your mouth, with or without herbs, is a very bad idea. You're more likely to get infected with a plague from a rodent than to get rid of the pain. But the ancient Egyptians didn't have any such knowledge, so they often acted at random or relied on someone else's experience. Even very controversial. If one of your friends said that a mouse paste helps against toothache, then it had to help. And if it didn't, well, probably the gods didn't wish so, or something like that. But Egypt's not the only place where they experimented with dead mice. If you had problems with warts and lived in England, a dead mouse would be cut in half and applied right to the warts. It seems like this was supposed to make them go away. Don't ask why. Spiderweb would also seem a weird medical choice. Although the spiders don't seem like trustworthy creatures, their web is supposedly an excellent natural remedy for healing cuts and scrapes. In ancient Greece and Rome, doctors used spider webs to make bandages for their patients. Spider webs are believed to have natural antiseptic and antifungal properties, which means they can help keep wounds clean and avoid infections. Spider webs are also said to be rich in vitamin K, which promotes blood clotting, essentially making the wound heal faster. Seems like a great cure. It's a shame it doesn't work like that. Recent studies have shown that all these stories about the miraculous power of the web are not just a myth, it's a myth that's the exact opposite of the real things. Spiders use their webs to protect their eggs, which have a high content of nutrients the microbes are after. But apparently the web repels microbial attacks just like a wall, a physical barrier. It has no special antimicrobial properties. Although, of course, the web is still very strong and at the same time light. Also, unlike silkworms, spiders live literally everywhere, including that far corner over there. This means that if people could learn how to weave spider silk, they'd get a cheap but very strong fabric. Who would say no to such a thing? Especially since people know how to make use of spider silk. For example, in the Solomon Islands, indigenous people designed a setup involving a kite, a line, and a spider silk to catch the elusive needlefish. Despite all this, spiders stay away from our machines. No one has yet managed to use them in the textile industry, for some kind of large-scale production at least, although people have tried many times. In the 1700s, the French naturalist Bon de Saint Hilaire presented a set of spider silk gloves and stockings to the French Academy. He was able to collect enough material by promising his neighbors to pay for the web for the price of silk. Can you imagine how happy they were? But when the spider web clothes were delivered to the king, he was not impressed. It seems like the material was quickly torn and his majesty was offended. In the 1800s, France made another attempt to turn spider silk into an industry. This time, the attempt was made by a spider specialist named Paul Camboet. He invented a device allowing him to extract the web directly from the spider, not gather it in the corners. The spider was placed in a wooden structure so that its abdomen was sticking out on one side and the legs and head on the other. Then you only had to touch the spider with the tip of your finger so that the web stuck to it. And then you could reel it out. It was the first attempt at some kind of spider industrialization. The work of the arachnologist resulted in the establishment of a small farm for the production of spider silk in Madagascar. Camboe hired local women to catch spiders in baskets, stuff them into wooden devices, and extract spider silk. It was then made into a bed canopy, which was shown at the Paris exhibition of 1900. It had seemed like this is a success, but the spiders definitely didn't want to be a part of it. I mean, at all. They spun their webs all over the place where they were held, so actively that no insects got in. No insects means no food. The spiders needed something to eat just to stay alive, so they started eating each other. Only the strongest and the largest ones survived. Naturally, spiders like that couldn't be used anymore. Perhaps that's why the spiders failed to replace the silkworms. They're too factious to be farmed. Of course, I am not saying that in the future people won't come up with some other way to produce silk on an industrial scale. After all, they did learn how to transfer spider genes into goats. We already mentioned this in one of the older videos, but if you want more details, let me know in the comments. And yet, it's so great that we no longer use chickens, mash mice, or rotting whales for medical purposes. Actually, animals aren't particularly involved in the treatment of people, except for horseshoe crabs. Horseshoe crabs are older than dinosaurs. 
They've been around for 450 million years, which means they've watched the rise and fall of millions of other species. Horseshoe crabs have successfully survived the ice ages, various cataclysms, and other troubles that have happened in the history of our planet. But they're not just very tenacious, they are, in fact, living fossils. Horseshoe crabs have helped keep most of us alive. If you've ever had a vaccine, chances are that it was tested for safety using horseshoe crab blood. It contains important immune cells that are exceptionally sensitive to toxic bacteria. When these cells encounter invading bacteria, they clot around them and protect the rest of the horseshoe crab's body from toxins. I think this is one of the reasons why horseshoe crabs are so resilient. When scientists discovered this feature, they started using horseshoe crab blood to test new vaccines for contamination. This method has been used all over the world since the 1970s, and for many years, no one was able to find an alternative that would be as sensitive to toxins as horseshoe crab blood. Yeah, because of all these pharmaceutical tests, horseshoe crabs have had a hard time, but that's another story. And by the way, horseshoe crab blood has a great color. You can show it on YouTube without censoring. See you later.